Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. We're going to start off with a radar animation here. I want you to focus in on the storms that were moving through parts of Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio. This is what is left of the powerful low-pressure system that was on the back side of Tropical Storm Cristobal. And as it went through parts of these states here around the Great Lakes, produced a lot of severe weather damage. In fact, you can just see here that the total number of severe weather reports from yesterday almost hitting 500 hundred separate reports, a lot of straight line wind damage. Now, normally wind damage like this is going to cause a lot of uh, issues with stand quality, uh, giving us green snap with some of our crops like corn uh, planted in this part of the country. And it's a little bit too early in the morning for me to know exactly what these storms did in the overnight hours, but I'm anticipating a lot of reports of damage to crops in this area. Now, that same storm system, just rewind the clock back to June 9th and 10th as it sat in the midsection of the United States, produced synoptic scale winds. Not winds from thunderstorms, but synoptic scale winds that in some places in the central and high plains topped out over 50 miles an hour when looking at an hourly average wind speed. In other words, that was the sustained winds with this. Gusts in this area were getting up over 80 miles per hour. And the damage that we saw there, well, I think it was pretty evident from satellite. We can actually see here that as that storm system on the backside of Cristobal went through, it kicked up an enormous amount of dust and just, well, sandblasted a lot of the crop here in parts of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and eventually spreading east of there. This particular image was from uh, Sierra, but uh, was posted on Twitter by Scott from Scotland, one of my favorite follows here, just showing us what it looked like. And we looked at an animation of this in yesterday's Long Range Outlook as well. Something to point out, as Cristobal up here went through parts of Wisconsin, broke all-time records for lowest pressure uh, for this time in June. So this was a very rare combination of events that moved through the middle part of the United States. But to show you what those winds did, I want to thank Brett Parks for putting this out on Twitter. Uh, I initially thought that was a round bale, uh, but it turns out that's some sort of container that is getting blown by the strong winds here uh, in the central plains uh, across this roadway. Amazing to see that. And then also, Andy, thank you for sending this to me. Uh, just talking about some of the corn that was sandblasted in parts of Nebraska and the damage you can see. Or some of this was from thunderstorm damage because central Nebraska was lit up by severe weather earlier in the week. And then those strong synoptic scale winds, as he wrote about here, uh, just completely destroying some crop there. So we're going to have to wait and see how much damage we did get from this past storm system as the reports slowly start to come in. Okay, total rainfall. We can see the narrow corridor through which Cristobal went and then those severe storms on the back side. But as you just take a quick snapshot at who got rain and who did get rain over the last five days, there were some places in here in the Eastern Corn Belt that did miss some of the storms. But what I want to focus on, I think, in this video is this corridor in through here. Because there are places in the South Central Plains that have gone more than 20 days without rainfall. And that's going to be a major concern for me as we move forward. Now, something neat to point out to you, this is a map that shows you dew point temperatures 7 p.m. on Tuesday the 9th. So the main synoptic scale low is here, and this was all the moisture pushing ahead with Cristobal. Now, I live right over here in east central Illinois, and the nearest um, place, the nearest National Weather Service office that launches weather balloons is in Lincoln, Illinois. And so they launched a special balloon at 18Z, so this was middle of the day. And what I was interested in seeing was how much this looked like a tropical sounding, and it did. And the number I was after was this one right here, precipitable water, 2.21 inches. This is total column moisture amount that could be precipitated out. Now, the uh, Storm Prediction Center keeps an awesome archive showing you records for any given weather station that launches weather balloons on values like precipitable water. And right now for June uh, 9th, we can see that that would be the new all-time record for the highest amount of total columnar water uh, in that particular case. Normally it's down here. Look at this. That's average. So incredible to see that. Well, much drier air has moved in. We need to be talking about how this is going to change our temperatures and what it's going to mean for uh, for fire threat out west. And let's talk about that first. You see, June 9th soil moisture anomalies. We can see that unlike a year ago, much of the south central part of the United States is very dry. Now, we have yet to see what the true effect of Cristobal was as it got here through parts of Iowa and into Wisconsin, because we just saw a few moments ago that up to three to five inches of rain, locally even some heavier amounts, did pass through uh, this area as Cristobal went through. But I'm going to come back to the central plains and talk about some of my major concerns there. Because over the next seven days, 
While the eastern half of the United States stays cool, the heat begins to rebuild in the middle part of the United States. And in the southern plains with some southwest winds, I'm anticipating very high evaporation rates. In fact, it went off my color bar here, which means there are well over three inches of total evaporation. So that's again that area that missed out a lot of that precipitation. Now, with some of the higher winds in that region and then west of there, we are going to be on the lookout uh, throughout the day today. And then again on Friday for um, elevated risk here of um, of fires. Uh, maybe some dry thunderstorms that put down downdrafts that are in this area that could also put down very strong winds. So I'm very concerned about fire threat in the west over the next few days here. Looking out over the next week, most of the action is going to be right here in parts of the Mid-Atlantic and the Carolinas, where we may pick up um, in some locations well in excess of three to five inches of rainfall. But because the jet stream is largely going into a pattern producing upper level convergence over the midsection of the United States, that's a pretty big donut hole there of drier weather. We're going to be watching for some northwest flow, bringing in some precipitation here in the northern plains. But much of the action, again, is going to be out in the uh, uh, along the east coast and it's going to be here uh, in the northwest. Do notice it seems as though we're getting a little bit of monsoonal action here but remember some of the thunderstorms that will be produced in this area as I just mentioned will be producing downdrafts loaded with precipitation that evaporate before they hit the ground. We call that virga so that's why they're called dry thunderstorms. Now just to show you what the operational European model is looking at in terms of precipitation notice the parts of South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia we may be looking at uh, some locations picking up several inches of rain as this deep upper level low just sits and spins over this area for a while. Let me show it to you here. We're going to watch this animation and pick out a couple of different things, but keep your eye right here. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, see that upper level low just sitting and spinning over parts of the southeast? Two things I want to point out besides that, I noticed that in this animation, let's watch it again together, we do not see any alarming blocking setting up. In other words, big high pressure cells occupying Greenland or Alaska and not moving. In fact, the second thing I want to point out to you is that right over the Aleutian Islands, we continue to get tropical, um, excuse me, not tropical, but deep uh, upper level lows that form. They kind of just move slowly uh, toward the east. And that keeps putting kind of another wave that comes through the, the, the northwest. And these waves keep moving into the U.S. The bit slower now, but they're moving. I don't see anything that's alarming me in terms of getting everything blocked up. But we do know that over the next week, it's going to be dry in the midsection of the United States as temperatures really rebound here in the central and high plains first and then start to spread east with time. So this map I'm drawing on here is week one precipitation anomalies. Now, part of that dryness is being fed on the fact that instead of getting return moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico, if you look in the midsection of the country, look at where the winds are coming from. They're coming more from New Mexico and Texas. So up here, as we look out on Monday, the trajectory of the wind didn't come out of the Gulf. It came out of the dry air in the high plains. And that's why we don't see the good moisture return that would be necessary to increase thunderstorm threat in this area as we look out over the next five to seven days or so. So I just wanted to point out that's a very subtle feature here, but it's important to understand the trajectory of the winds. They come any more from a southerly or southeasterly component. It's an entirely different precipitation regime for the next week. So looking at the European model, let me just play it forward for you here. All the action. See it over there with that low pressure cell sitting over the Carolinas and Virginia. It's also back. Just watch it again over the next 10 days here. It's in the Pacific Northwest. The midsection of the country, I do see the isobars packed tightly together on several days, which means I am anticipating very windy conditions in the central plains. And many of us here are asking, when is the wind going to stop? Because it's been a very windy spring and early summer. But like we said, we do need to watch the north central plains here as we work out into the next week to 10 days for possibly setting us up at times with some better upper level support for more thunderstorm activity. And I'm going to show you that by looking at the flow path pattern all the way out to day 10. See it here? Once again, at day 10, we still have deeper troughs pulling through the Aleutian Islands into the Gulf of Alaska, ridging around the west. But you see this broader trough and sitting in this area? This is what could possibly give us more better chances of getting some storms into week two uh, across the north central plains. And how far they make it to the south and southeast will be determined as we get to see what the, the, the jet stream pattern sets up like and where the moisture is. There's another thing I want to point out, and it's right here, okay? With a high pressure cell in the upper levels 
of the atmosphere kind of sitting north of the Lesser Antilles. The question is, as we get beyond week two, do we see ring of fire type precipitation coming up in this area? Because right now, looking at the GFS ensemble for week two, which again gets us out to the 25th, and the European ensemble for the same time period. Notice both models trying to bring in more stormy uh, action here in stormy action, try to bring in more thunderstorms into the uh, north central part of the United States. And the GFS really wants to keep the Great Lakes wet as well. What about the European? Well, both the European and the GFS are seeing this dry in through here, but right around its edge, you can see more thunderstorm activity. And one of the questions I have is, are we going to be seeing higher pressure sitting here along the Gulf Coast while we do have a little bit of a lull in tropical activity and get some ring of fire precipitation around the edge of it? You know, when we look at that, we need to understand what the temperatures are doing too. So let's, let's put that whole story together. Then we're going to go look at the beginning of July. What I'm showing you first is big breakdown in temperatures right here after the last seven days put down some serious heat in that part of the country. So the breakdown is happening now, but this is the last seven days of temperature anomalies. Now you can see that cooler weather. See it squeezing in through this part of the country today with highs struggling to get out of the 70s, for example, in the Great Lakes states. But as I mentioned, watch the heat rebound here. And for the West Coast, you are going to continue on your roller coaster ride. By the way, one other thing to point out, Phoenix, we keep adding up these 100 degree days. It's impressive to see how we're doing there. Okay, Thursday's high temperatures and departure from normal. Let's get right into Friday. Cool weather around the Great Lakes. Cool all the way down to the southeast compared to normal. But look at this. By Saturday, getting into Sunday and Monday, the heat is back on in the central part of the United States. It's going to take a while for the cooler weather to get out of here. Cooler than average, I should say. But deep into the 90s and triple digits here, that's what's given that high evapotranspiration rate in the south central plains. And as you saw, not much precipitation. By Tuesday, getting into next Wednesday, now the heat begins to rebound across a broader sector in the mid part of the country. And the jet stream is generally favoring a pattern that's doing something a bit more like that with time. Why it remains cool over here in the southeast getting up into the mid-Atlantic. That's where that upper level trough is sitting. Okay. So that takes you out for the next week on those temperatures. Beyond that in six to 10 day time period, right in through here, this is where we're really going to be seeing the temperatures crank back up. The GFS sees it. The European model sees it. Cooler northwest, cooler in the east, but in the mid part of the country, those temperatures are really cranked up. Now, what we're going to have to watch is the how the end of June transitions into the beginning of July. At this particular point, because the atmosphere seems to be staying unblocked, notice the warmth coming back into the west. So do you notice the west keeps seeing these temperature swings? That tells me that the pattern is not stuck. And what it's doing is it's going to cool off temporarily the central United States, bring some warmth back over to the east, but it's going to keep moving. Uh, the European sees it as well. Although the models do not agree on what's happening around the Hudson Bay, we do see the relief coming in here in the midsection of the country, but then the warmth on the coasts. So this seems to be the way that the end of June is starting to shake down here. Now, in my long range update yesterday, please go watch it. I really discussed these things. If there's a couple of things that I'm concerned about, it's the fact that the Man Julian oscillation seems to be stuck in the standing wave over Africa. That'd be phase one and two. The La Nina is still weak. Uh, but the North Pacific is warm. And as the trade winds pick back up again, we're going to see if the La Nina effects begin to really manifest themselves into July and, and, and August. But in the near term, I'm not seeing that. Now, the global atmospheric angular momentum, which we've been watching carefully, has dropped. We reported about it yesterday. But a lot of that drop has been in the Southern Hemisphere, not in the North Pacific. And so when we continue to see strong winds in through here, and over there with general ridging in this area as I look out here toward the end of June, this and this is what tells me that if we keep those winds fast, I don't have a reason to say that the pattern's going to get stuck for a long time. Now, I could be wrong, but that's what I'm looking at here. Uh, last thing, if I could tell you one area I'm most concerned about, it's the Southern Plains. And I think we've made a case for that in the last few videos here. Okay, so I want to reiterate some things I showed in yesterday's long range update. I need to be watching the trends for this time period because while we are anticipating a warm end of June and a warm start to July, looks as though the highest anomalies are going to be out west. Okay, what I'm also seeing for the first week of July is notice the dryness here, but around it, we're seeing wetter conditions. 
Now this would be critical wet conditions here in the part of in the part of the Corn Belt, uh, and, and also into the Canadian uh, 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 Ag Belt right up into this area, the Canadian Prairies. So we need to watch. Uh, tomorrow morning I'll get some brand new updates for this time period from the European Weeklies, and I'll be reporting that in my regional video, and of course talking about it next week. But that's one thing I'm going to be watching carefully. I also just want to reiterate the new forecast that came out for July, August, and September. The National Multimodel Ensemble did broaden the sector that it did show with near average to drier than average conditions and some of that does move in uh, to the central corn belt but it's keeping the southeast wet and look at the trajectory of its wettest conditions coming out of the main development region for hurricanes again we're still thinking about a very active hurricane season as the la nina over here really gets going and calms down the wind shear to show you quickly the previous run from may and the latest run from the beginning of june for july august and september okay about the biggest difference in the european model is that it's come in with a slightly drier signal here just barely it just moved from near average in that area to drier and we've dried out this area a little bit June, July, August. I think we are seeing the effect here of the developing La Nina at this point. But this is still not cause for major concern for me as I don't anticipate anything shutting down thunderstorm activity. What about temperatures? Well, we've shifted from last month's run, the heat from the west more toward the central part of the United States in the most recent run. And again, this is a forecast for July, August, and September. So I want to just reiterate those points. Go back and watch that long range video from yesterday. Quick international update. Next 10 days from the European model over Europe. Very unsettled weather from the Iberian Peninsula in through parts of Germany. But also notice around the Black Sea, several locations, especially here in Ukraine, showing up wet. Soil moisture anomalies have come up lately and the heat is coming back on into that area. So we need to pay attention to how the crops are going to be changing there. And finally, I want to take you down to South America again. We're going to stop talking, I think, day to day about South America as they move into, um, you know, winter here here, but the monsoonal rains have shut off. It's still wet down here in southern Brazil and parts of northern Argentina, but they're harvesting a safrina crop here. Some of the research I'm working on right now is to understand, are we seeing drier dry seasons, which are the winter, in this section? Because we've noticed the last few years that we've gone into the next planting season, which is going to happen in about four months, uh, three to four months, uh, we've gone into that planting season with exceptionally dry conditions, drought conditions. I'll research it and report back to you, okay? I hope that you all have a great end to your week. I'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you for giving me attention this week, and we'll talk to you then. Thank you.